Excellent. Shalom Aleichem. Aleichem Shalom to you. And nice to see you. We are early, of course. Yes, well, I'm always early. Yeah, me too. <laughs> I find it is an enormous drawback living in America and being early. Well, I happen to believe you have a choice. Some people are frightened of being early, some people are frightened of being late. Mm. Two, two groups in the world. And I'm married to somebody who hates being early. <laughs> <laughs> I, remember, so I remember when... The, tell me what the organization's doing. Right, so the organization is um, trying to set up groups uh, in places like Brooklyn and in Washington, D.C. and in Los Angeles and across the United States of America and broader, uh, which will be groups of Balishuv will be able to give themselves support um, in the various unique problems, and I think you can use the word unique, that they will become, that they come across as Balishuv. Um, so that if you're having difficulty getting your child into a, into a school, it might be that you are a bit in shock that the community that seemed to be so welcoming to you when you began your journey, suddenly once you have completed it, don't want your children to be members of the, sh the school or the shul because you um, were welcomed by them originally. It's, it's a bit strange. Then there are, there are millions of other, well, been lots and lots of other issues that Bali Chiba will, will face that an FFB person won't face, like how do I deal right. with with right. my, uh, we've covered that in one of the other ones actually, is how do I deal with uh, uh, um, my non from family? How do I feel about my parents? How do my children deal with their non from grandparents? And lots of questions like that. But also I'm aware that particularly in today's session, talking about the, the difficulties that male value should deal with, uh, I'm actually working on the idea of uh, perhaps not all of the Bali Chuba who leave yeshivas have caught up to the level that they want to, and maybe even didn't quite come to grips with the, the fundamentals of learning more, et cetera. So I'm actually trying to work on putting together a program that, that would be, again, a session like this, but people could uh, discreetly join and uh, uh, fill in uh, some gaps in their learning. The, the, the buzzword is really discretion. It, some of these groups are a little bit like um, Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, or any, any group that people can join without necessarily saying who they are um, and can participate in sessions without, as it were, giving away the fact. If I can be of any use to you, I'm happy to do so. Excellent, that's fabulous. On, on a, also, uh, I might leave them my email um, just in case anybody wants to talk to me one on one. Excellent. So, Good. So we're, li we're live streaming on Facebook as well. I see that. Oh, you can see that. Excellent. So, good. So with a bit of luck, uh, people will start joining us. As I said to you uh, when we spoke yesterday, the strange thing is that we, the numbers actually joining and coming online, like somebody has come on now, uh, are usually quite small. Um, but by the next day, there's something like 700 or 800 people have watched the video and watched the session. So, you know, you're, we are, are reaching the idea is reaching uh, out. So that's, that's the you see, I happen to believe that numbers in every area are completely irrelevant. There's a hashgacha in the world. I'll tell you a story some other time. The biggest success I think I ever had in Kirov was in a certain place where the event I went for was cancelled. And the Rav feeling embarrassed for me. It was a huge snowstorm. And, you know, I come you know, partly from, from the north of England, partly from Scotland, my mother lives Charlotte. So I don't know that you, when things are snowing, you start. So I got there. So he brought in two families to the shore. These families became from the very well-known people to them. So I don't see numbers <laughs> being a very important at all. Right. Good. Good. All right. Well, Your thought. So Rifke, who's just appeared here, Rifke Khan lives in Brooklyn, she has very kindly expressed interest in uh, being my um, Brooklyn representative with her husband to set up a group in Brooklyn, uh, which is one, one of the, the areas which there are lots of value to the, the whole idea of, if, if nothing else, the people who are active in the field across the generation 
letting people know that we we're still with them. We're still with them. class in London. <laughs> I think that's my wife singing away to herself. Let's just mute her. Yes. yes. Do you know Doniel and Melissa Glass in London? I don't think so. I, don't think I would suggest you get in touch with them. Okay. Two wonderful people. I will send you their uh, yeah. contact info. They met at Cambridge. They mm. came from later. And uh, quite remarkable people. And she has on these subjects that you're talking about, she has a very nuanced view. Excellent. Yeah, I will send you that, Blinada. Oh, wow. How's, how's your granddaughter? You can't. You've been you muted. haven't put on your thing. I've unmuted him. He's still muted. Oh, I don't know why. Not me. I'm pressing unmute. He must have muted himself. That's yeah. Cool. Oh, hi. <laughs> How's the baby? I can't hear you, for heaven's sake. Get your thing off. We cannot hear. Robert gets in. Usually I have no ob ob objection to your being muted, but here I wanted to hear <laughs> what your granddaughter's doing. Where's your headphones, Rabbi? <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> all right, let's get down to business, Rabbi. Yes, I think we'll just have to let people join us as, as, we, as we go along and as it's being recorded. Fine, okay. Uh, the formal introduction. I received an email from Rabbi Reston this morning saying, don't say anything at all about me except that I started Neve 50 years ago and I've not been able to find another job since. So, and I used to work for, uh, the, I was the Northern representative for Neve and Orsameach way back in the, I don't know, 1640s, around about that, or so it seems. Um, certainly, uh, I am, uh, I've to, I'm allowed to say that we are, we are very good friends, which I'm very proud to do. I also think I can squeeze in that I very often ask the rabbi for advice, um, which I value very much. Okay, that's all I'm allowed to say. So uh, let me tell, in case you're new or you're watching this, this is the Near Tamid Initiative, an initiative, an initiative to support people who were not born from um, and who became from, uh, for whatever reason, along the journey, whether you're a Baal Tshuva, a Baal Tshuva, whether you're a Gero, or a late start of whatever identity, um, the Near Tamid Initiative is there to try and help you by uh, presenting um, webinars like this every two weeks, by setting up uh, groups in various cities so that you, people can help themselves and various other initiatives, initiatives which I will be telling you about. We have a Facebook page, please check that out. We have a website, you can get that from the Facebook page and so you can keep in touch and uh, I hope you will be supporting um, in every possible way the work that we're trying to do to try and help the large community of Bobby Chuba who sometimes have unique issues which you, you need, which need unique solutions. So with that, um, out the way, I'm going to invite Rabbi Resson to perhaps uh, give some insights of the issues that perhaps a male Baal Tshuva particularly, but of course male Baal Tshuva marry female Baal Tshuva, um, and they become the fathers of every child of a Baal Tshuva. So therefore it's important to have insights as to their issues, struggles they may face, and maybe for him to suggest a solution or two to the, those same issues. So I will now stop talking and introduce you to Rabbi David Ramsey. Thank you. Um, Rabbi Rosenberg, the Colonel of Raqqa, the founder of, of um, Machon something or other, um, was not, he was not in favor of teaching women anything. So he once uh, asked me something to compare the yeshivas for, for Bali Chuvas, I told him, listen, my friend, no difference whatsoever. They're all cannon fodder for Shiduchim. That's all they are, the Yeshivas. Cannon fodder for, for Shiduchim. And that was more or less the end of our relationship. 
it, 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 uh, it behooves us to consider what went wrong. I mean, many things went right. My teacher, Abelia Lapians at Sal, said that a major difference between our generation, talking about my generation, this was a conversation which happened 55 years ago, and the generations before, he said that in earlier generations, no one believed that what one could survive life without constant introspection. Everybody did some kind of his vain analysis, beta dust, and it just was a question of where you did it. If you were a Balmusa, so you went into the forest and found a tree trunk. And if you were a, a breast lover, you went into a beta chorus, but everybody did it. Nobody believed you could li leave life, live life in a continuum. And <clears throat> in fact, in last week's parasha, we know that there are no psuchas and stumos, there is no par paragraph. And the Chazal and the Medrash say that this was the failing of Bilam. He never took time out to say, what's happening? Am I doing the right thing? Am I supposed to continue? And why, why were there psuchas and stumos? The Chazal tell us that it was to give place, pause, for Moshe Rabbeinu, Lahovin in parasha, la parasha. He also needed this bayinus. He had to pause between each parasha of the Kedush Baruch who told him. And the Medrash says there, Allah has come of a camel. When it comes to us that we need to pause and think. And this, I think, has been very much missing. And it's now half a century. It's hard to say that. It's half a century. And uh, Really, we should perhaps be, be thinking about things. All of us were wet behind the ears uh, 50 years ago. Uh, that didn't affect our confidence, but we were all wet behind the ears. And there was a feeling that we were riding a wave, which we were, and that we were succeeding. Because all in all, there were many, many successes. And very little time was spent wondering what was happening about, in my case, the women who didn't come back. They came for some classes, didn't come back. What was it that was happening? But one does tend to think on the, on the side of the positive that many people were staying. Um, it was a world of extremes then, certainly the way we presented it to our students. Uh, many people talk endlessly about the failures of Western civilization and, uh, and how, uh, how pernicious it was, etc., etc. And I don't think at any time if we ask ourselves what was supposed to be the material that people needed. In Al Sameach, there was no question, it was Gemara. In Asia Terra, it was the 48 ways plus other ways. Everybody had their very definitive views about where we should go. Also, when it came to evaluating results, things were not that great because we didn't look into it properly. Um, we didn't look into why it was that people would leave later on, why they would have problems. Um, I'm going to say, some ideas which are absolute generalizations. Absolute generalizations. Uh, and as always, I invite dissent. The idea that learning Torah is a good idea for Bali Chuva is of very questionable. I don't want to be an happy girl, you know. I'm always worried about my, my headshot appearing in the, on the walls in Meir Sha'arim. Um, I think it was overemphasized. I can tell you that the Rosh Yeshivas went to Rav Shach and asked him about people learning in Kailal, Bali Chuva, learning in Kailal, 
after they were married? And he said, absolutely not. They should go into a profession. Whatever they were trained for, they should do. I went unwisely to Rebaran Leib Steinman 25 years later, and I didn't present the question because I always get straw men. I always get somebody to present the question. So I said, somebody asked him that, and he said, Kfahira Zoke. Zoke, meaning Rav Shach, already made a decision on this. There's no place in Kailalim for Bali Chuba. Of course, the question is that so many of them are half baked as a result. Yes, absolutely. But if there is a lesson which has been learned from the last 50 years, it's that happy marriages are based upon husbands who are earning a good living. I'm not saying this merely in the field of Bali Chuba, but they really would be going a little bit out of my bailiwick. But it's a big Nisaya. It's a big Nisaya for a family to be learning. As one young man told me, a 15 year old, a few years ago, he said, I didn't sign up for that. I didn't sign up for it. It's all very nice. My father's learning. It's not what I want. In the very primitive research that I've done, there is no question that when there is Parnosa in the house, it has effects which are very far reaching. First of all, when it comes to integration into the community, it's a lot easier for professionals, for people who are serving the community at large, people who are doing a job, it's far easier for them to become accepted. In terms of children, there's no question in my mind that on the whole, the children of those people who are working are doing better than the children of those who are learning. Now, of course, a number of caveats here. First of all, if indeed the money is there, that the, that the child does not feel that he's living in straightened circumstances. So that makes it a lot easier. But the respect in which a father is held has a huge, it's a huge part of how the child looks at the father. And, and I say this not with respect to uh, only, there's a, a, there's a Kylo here in Yerushalayim that I go to on fast days, when there's a time for mincha. Particularly, it's not easy the whole time to get into the right mood on, uh, on uh, Tanis Esther. I go to this kailo. For mincha, I get into the mood. Depressed, feeling awful. These people have been there for 30 years in this kailo. And they've become more and more bent over. And it's a great place for Mincha. And if any of you here in Yerushalayim, then buy it for Gam for the next Tanis Esther, you can join me. We have to know. And I'll say something, um, probably unwisely. A few years ago, something came up in Lakewood. And the Rashi Yeshivas felt that I was partly responsible for it. So they called me in. And I explained to them what I believed was the truth. And the, the, the person who took me in was my friend, Rabbi Matisio Solomon Zalegazuntzain, who comes from the same neck of the woods as I do. And he was a real Talmud of Rebellia, unlike me. And we've had a Kesha ever since. So he said to me, David, don't say anything that'll make me ashamed. If, if I kick you, just stop in the middle of the sentence. So I finished what they had, what they asked, I gave an answer for. And then one of the Rosh Yeshivas said to me, you know, we have a problem. There's 5% of the kids in, uh, in Lakewood who aren't in Meisters. They can't be in the Meisters. 
So I said to him, Moshele Moa Dova Doime, imagine you go to a city, you need to buy a pair of shoes, and they tell you there's only one shoe shop. All right. You go to this shoe shop, and over the door, there's a banner which says, one size fits all. And you go in, and you talk to the proprietor, and you say to him, you have a very good business here. One size fits all. And he said, I'll tell you. You would think so, but there's at least 5% who can't get their feet into one size shoe. I said, what would you have said? You would say, this is a nice colloid. This is a revealed miracle that 95% of people can get their feet into one size shoe. I said, here in Lakewood, it's one size fits all. Not only is learning Gemara all you do from morning till night, but it's learning it in a particular way. You can't. If you say you'd like to finish Shas, they say not in our yeshiva. We don't do that. The key is you can learn for an hour or two a day. So clearly we're setting ourselves up for failure worldwide. And in as much as there's not much hope in liberalizing the yeshivas, by this time I should say that that uh, Rapatisio had a neck lock on me. He finished kicking me. He had a neck lock. He was trying to, to drag me out. Um, this is what it's about. We're facing a system which makes no sense. It makes no sense whatsoever. Now, of course, this, it's fueled by statements which they quote, and I have no way of, of disputing this, that uh, Rabaran Kotler said that in wartime there's casualty. But occasionally, when the casualties mount up, you have to start asking yourself, uh, you know, is this a milchemes mitzvah? Or should we be thinking in some other direction? A Balchuva who goes into Kailo, he's bound to be third rate. If he's excellent, he could become second rate. But there are given limits. You start too late, there's no catching up. That's all. Are you surrounded by geniuses? Of course you're not but there's no catching up. And this is a very painful thing when people paint themselves into a corner. Does it mean that you face a life of ignorance? Well, if you're earning a good living, you get yourself a chavrusa at night, there's more chance of becoming familiar, of becoming a Talmud Chacham. If you, you're a person who earns a living, does what's right, and also learns. And I'm in favor of learning, don't get me wrong. I'm in favor of learning. The fact that I don't practice that much of it is, is situational, but I'm in favor of it. So I believe this idea that we started off pushing everybody into going to Kailo is something which we suffer a great deal from. Um, people were told to leave in the middle to leave their university courses. I believe that was disastrous advice. Now here, yeah, I have to be Malamed Schuss. Much of the worst advice that our women got was from people who were not part of the school. They went for Shabbos to some house and we had to deprogram them for a month afterwards, the ideas that the people said there about Torah as the best of Shora. The yeshivas aren't the only ones who are to blame here. But I must tell you one story, which happened 45 years ago. There was a woman in the Ve who had finished her Ivy League education and had a place in a very, very distinguished university to do medicine. And she went somewhere for Shabbos, and the idiot husband told her she's, she won't remain firm. It's going to be a tragedy. What's going to be? It's terrible. So this guy called himself a rabbi. And I decided the only thing I could do to outflank them was to go to with Moshe Feinstein with the young lady. So I went to Moshe Feinstein with this woman. And before she came into the room. Ramesha said to me, look, what makes you so sure that she'll keep a Yiddish guy? 
I said, this girl will become former in university. She always does the opposite of what people want of her. You know, this is the way it's going to be. So she, she came in and Ramosha said to her, who paid for your undergraduate education? She said, my father. He said, I hear you went to a very good university. How much did it cost? I think then for the four years, it was all of $50,000, 45 years ago. So Ramosha said, $45,000, this is a famegan, which means that's a fortune. You have a very fine father. Yeah. Why did he pay for it? He said, because he wanted that I should be a doctor. He said, that's why he pays it for definitely. He's always had this dream of my being a medical doctor. And that's what he wanted. So he said to her, he said, look, Certainly, you have to be careful when you're going into a secular environment. I thought, well, we want you to know that we find in Chazal that sometimes Chazal base their decisions on the fact that Chos HaKadosh Baruch Hu al Mamoinam Shel Yisrael, that a Kadosh Baruch Hu has Rachmanus on the money that Jews spend. Now, after you've taken four years university tuition from your father, you're going to turn around and say you're not going. I don't think you should do it. The girl, is, I, don't want to, I don't want to say too much. She's a very distinguished person today in the medical field. Uh, children, and even here, <laughs> since she's a ballast children, I'm giving away too much. She had a whole slew of children in Brist. <laughs> And uh, some ladies in B'nai Sara in my school, which is the equivalent of Brist for women. No, no, no. <laughs> this is the way it is, a pillar of the community. And I have tens of examples of this. Tens of examples. The question is, do we change? you have to excuse me while there's a big shile of Loyeg Larash to drink in front of people who uh, are still fasting, but uh, the fast ended here. <laughs> so, I don't That's my conclusion. My conclusion is that Rav Shach was right. What can I tell you? Um, we take the blame in the Kirov world for a great deal of extremism. All of a sudden, my daughter did this. And what we really see, I think, since my, I don't have to worry about my grandchildren getting married anymore. I taught judo here in Yerushalayim 45 years ago. And when you start a course for judo, you get all the local thugs turning up. who are looking for ways of making themselves more powerful. And the way it's dealt with universally, this problem is for the first three sessions, you teach how to fall. You don't teach them anything. And you see that little by little, it's winnowed down and the right people are left. There are some people, whatever they start, they do it by buying the equipment. See if you like it, see if you need it. You no, know, no, they come the first time to the first session, all dressed up for the, for the event. You see this kind of thing, this is the way they attack life and their gormless parents buy them these things, they buy them this equipment. You know, my father Shalom said to me, he has the feeling that my center of gravity is in the wrong place for sport. He would like to see me on the field do something, you know, before he starts investing in me. People became from and become from the way they go into everything else in life. And if they're extreme people, it's very hard to stop them. You try desperately to talk some sense into them. 
it's once in a yeshiva. The boy came for Shabbos from a yeshiva to us. And I could see he had sort of the beginnings of payers. He couldn't read Hebrew. He, Mamish couldn't read. He benched in English and everything. I said, what are the payers for? He said, ah. Oh. He said, I spoke to my grandmother and she told me that one of my ancestors comes from Poland. I said, so what? <laughs> well, that's Hasidim. I'm going to be a Hasid. Anyway, there was other, other people at the table. I couldn't say straight away, which was very good, because by after Shabbos, I had quietened down a little bit. But I still said to him, you maniac. Because you have one grandfather who comes from Poland, so you're starting to grow pears. Does that make sense to you at all? What is this? But this is the way people are. This is the way people are. I have a method of knowing when a girl becomes from an Eretz Yisrael, how difficult it will be with her parents when she comes home. I just say to her, tell me, when was the last time you had a dispute with your parents? So in most cases, I, say, I never had a dispute with my parents. Everything was great. If I say to them, this is what you do. You go to Gula, you buy a pot. You go home with a pot and you say to your parents, you don't want to inconvenience them. You will cook your food in the corner you don't want to get in the way. And your mother will say to you, what do you mean? We'll make the place kosher for you. This has happened, I think it's not an exaggeration to say hundreds of times that parents fall into line if they have a lovely daughter who's never given them problems. So this is it, they, they accommodate. If on the other hand, life has been a 15 round boxing match, and the parents have never forgiven and never forgotten any of it about the things the daughters got up to. So this becomes simply one more round in the battle of life. So the parents start be objecting to it. No, we don't want this, we don't want that. There's a program which is going on at the moment. Uh, it's the last week this week, a television program. Um, seven people who have cut the connection with either their brothers or with other siblings or their parents when they became from or vice versa. And it's been a huge hit here in Israel. And it shows they, there was a, they gave everybody a madrich to talk to them. And it was absolutely amazing. It's been a top selling series. I haven't seen it, but it, it's been a top selling series. But basically, it, it just repeats what I told you before. In those families where there was a troubled relationship, this served as an ideal casus belli to break the relationship. But where the relationship was a good one, people break it off because of Yiddishkeit. However, gauche the Balchuva is in explaining what he wants, and explaining to the parents the heat of Ghanim, etc. Parents with a good kid, they accommodate when the kid has just been battling with them forever. So then it becomes just one more round in the battle. I have never in 50 years of Neve seen an exception to that rule. I once, there was one young lady who said to me, her mother's being entirely unreasonable. And she's not taking seriously the fact that she's become from. So Neve was very, very small at the time. I said, I'm going to go and speak to your mother. So made an appointment, went to see the mother. And she said, my daughter probably told you that I'm being unreasonable, right? I said, yes, she did. So she went upstairs and came down with these orange robes. She said, Three years ago, my daughter joined the Marishi G. What do I know about Marishi G? I may not be much of a Jew, but I certainly don't believe in, in that kind of thing. But I bought her the orange robe. She says, a year later, she comes back. She's Jews for Jesus. She wants me to buy her at Salem, a crucifix. 
So we had a bit of a fight. I bought it. She said, Rabbi, if I'm being unreasonable, tell me. When I question the longevity of this decision that my daughter's made, I just don't know if things are going to be right here. Um, what was I supposed to say? That this was a more sincere choice? I didn't even know that to be the truth. I said to the mother, you're absolutely right. I'm going to tell her that for the first three months, she'll buy a pot, she'll cook in the corner, and you don't have to do anything for her. In the end, the mother came round, not because of anything I did, but because the girl became a little bit more intelligent as, as time went on. We produced people who our black and white picture in life suited very well. It suited them down to the ground. Because this is what they'd always believed. It could be that the white was different, the black was different, but there were black and white people. And these kinds of people, the Kuntz is to stop them and say to them, don't do anything for the moment. Wait and see whether it's for you. Confident in the knowledge that if it really is for them, later on will be fine. If it's not for them, you may as well save yourself the misery. So these are all things which I believe, with a little bit of seichel on our part, we could have forecast better. Never tell people to leave university. It's not a good idea. It's not a good idea. Even in the worst circumstances, somebody who really feels a cash at the Yiddish guy will be able to grow on campus, much better than it was years ago. Now there are so many more people on campus. Um, how long have I spoken for? Long enough. Wow, <laughs> M far too long. Oh, enjoying it. Pardon? I'm enjoying every moment. Oh, thank you, thank you. You know, my wife, I said to my wife, I was invited to this new group. She said to me, David, you have no problem being invited to new forums the whole time. Have you ever noticed? that nobody ever invites you back. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've got a question or two for you. This, uh, this question comes from uh, somebody, we will call him Joseph because that's his name. And I used to teach him in Shari Yoshev, as he's one of my Talmudian. And he wants the following question. He says, not sure how to put this well, perhaps Rabbi, you can restate, but I think it's put very well, so I'm just gonna read it. How can I balance the draw towards learning appropriate lingo and behaviors without just being an imitator, i.e. not having imposter syndrome, and yet trying to emphasize from substance, focusing on the real Kesher with learning and with Hashem. It's not a good question. It's a good question for boys in Ponovich, and it's a good question for this young Baal Shuva. It's not something which is dependent on the background. You see, basically, Basically, we always have to have aspirations which are greater than the actual. If we want to grow, and it's a mission in Pirkei Ovais, we have to have aspirations. However, we have to make sure that the aspirations and the actual are close together. Because when you have a big gap, you have, that's when you have the trouble. Growing, and this is the principle behind Sheva Yippoil Tzadik Rakam, according to the Baal Shem Tov, is that you have these periods of growth in which you are unbalanced. So the question becomes, what is it that I, what is the growth that I want in myself? Is it a growth with it which is inherent? Or is it a growth which is external? It's true that the Frum world may not look nicely at people who, are, who don't know the basics, but they have even a more dim view of those who are pretending. So pretending is never what you should do. Be yourself, this is it. And don't dress the part either. One of the things which attracted me to Kvach Hasidim 55 years ago was the fact that there was no uh, dress code of any kind. The boys all came from Mizrahi yeshivas, they came to Kvach Hasidim, 
and uh, and there was no dress code. Very much things of the essence. Development was very much emphasized, but not the. Uh, and so this was my training. And if you start, you know, welding hats on people, it doesn't make them B'nai Taira. It doesn't change them at all. And these yeshivas which do so, I think, are being remarkably narrow-minded about what improvement means. Things come naturally if you just wait. I Can I just jump in because there's something you said that interested me and uh, frankly troubled me in as much as, uh, I'm not sure how where I go with this one, but basically I know somebody um, in Manchester, very, very close uh, f uh, family friends. Uh, daughter went to Gateshead's um, Gates old seminary um, of course, the Harvard of Yale, I suppose, of, of FFB seminaries, uh, founded by Rabbi, De Rabbi Desna. And this friend of my late wife said, I'm very proud that I will have granddaughters and grandsons whose mother was, I think she was the sem rep top girl of the seminary. I thought that was an extremely balanced way of looking at it, but it's a difficult thing to sell to a Baal or Baal's teshuva when, after all, we're We've welcomed them to a world where the whole emphasis on is on learning, genius, achievement, how many black more, etc. It's hard to sell a product when you say at the same time you're never really going to be able to consume it all. How how do you? How do we? I think it, I think what this guy told you is utterly pathetic. He's living out his religious life on the back of his granddaughter. And I think it's pathetic. And I, I think, you know, being sem rep, while I understand that it's closest to God, at least in their view, but I think the whole thing is just unbelievably shallow. And it's part of what it's a part of what life's all about is, is losing these shallow things because if we don't, they infect our whole life. How things look become the only thing which is important. And that can't be the way it is. It comes from a lack of authenticity. In many of the yeshivas, including, uh, including Ponovich, when a, when a bocha gets married, he puts on a long, a long coat, like a Rosh Yeshiva wears. This apparently assures him that he's a Rosh Yeshiva in training, however long it takes, even if it never happens. I'll just tell you one anecdote. My daughter um, is, a, is a psychologist in Kiryat Sefer. And she, a couple of years ago, was in a, the Macaulay buying stuff. And she sees this woman, not somebody who sees her therapeutically, a woman she knows. And this woman says to her, this is my son, Shalom Bear. So my daughter being very nice, I wonder where she gets that from, bends down and says to him, Hi, Shali, how are you? So this woman says, no, please don't call him Shali. There's never been a goddle called Shali. So my daughter called me up that night and she said, she sees that she will have plenty of business down the pike as well. As quickly as she is curing people, the parents are producing new, new neuroses in these kids. It's part of things here. And it's a very unhealthy part of it. Very unhealthy. Uh, and I see there are people here just to let you know that if you want to ask a question, switch off your microphone and please do so. Or if you are too shy, you can send me a little message and I will see it without mentioning your name. Oh, uh, don't turn off your microphone and ask the question. Yes, exactly. you're really shy. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> The question, I do, uh, somebody else wrote a prepared question, the other, which was, uh, in fact, two people did. Uh, the question of finding a rov who gets me. Asal uh, Khorav. This is, a, it's so painful. This is so painful, this whole subject. But we should not believe that it's that much easier for the FFDs. Except in England, rabbis, in America are almost always part-time. They're doing other things. The Rabbanus is part-time for them. The amount of pastoral 
time that they are left with is very, very small. I'm very understanding of that. That means even if I was to believe that they would be the answer, I don't know them personally, of course, this is a generalization, but finding the right person to deal with Bali Chuva is just so, so difficult. Finding anyone who can climb out of their box and understand the way other people feel is so difficult. I was reading this week a book by a professor in Yale called Against Empathy. It's a very interesting book. The guy's not a mushkas, but he says, and I'm, you know, I don't think I'm doing justice to the book. He says that compassion is fine, but empathy is going too far. It, it empties you emotionally. You can have compassion to people. I'm in a good position and they're a nebuch. But when it comes to empathizing, so you're taking too much of the burden. And of course, as I said in, in one of my classes last night, the only qualification which Moshe Rabbeinu demonstrated was empathy. There's numerous Midrashim and Gemaras which say just how empathetic he was. In addition to the will to be empathetic, you also have to have some understanding of what it's like to be coming to Yiddishkeit. I have found that there are many excellent Balabatim who are better than Rabbonim in dealing and developing Bali Chuva. They, they're just sensible people. They have a chush for it. And I think that looking for rabbis is just uh, is almost a waste of time. When you find one, the reason he's not busy is either because everybody knows not to ask him any questions, he's a danger to life or limb, there's a reason for it. The talented people are besieged. That's the way it is. That's the way it goes. Rabbis, you know, there was a rabbi in Brooklyn many years ago, who dealt with this in a very real way. Himself was an absolute FFP. He was the last rabbi who I thought really got it. He really understood it. Uh, tragically, it was taken from us at a very young age. It's very hard to find these rabbis. I believe intelligent Balibatim who are Moikire Rabbonon and who in some cases have easier access to Rabbonim when it comes to asking Shilas are a better source of inspiration and assistance than any rabbi can be. But I'm being malamed on these rabbis that they don't do a much better job with their members either, with their old time members. They don't do a better job. They're usually spending 60% on that of their time on two families who have domestic strife and who plague them day and night. And they don't have that much time, that's all. They don't do the job properly. They don't have the requisite time. Okay, so I, we are keeping Rabbi Resson from breaking his... No, head. don't worry about me. Okay. Not that I'm the male in our cash business. Just, don't worry about me. That's <laughs> it. I have to earn my spiritual keep somehow. I see Las, I'll get with somebody from Las Vegas there. Anybody got a question? Because I've got, I've got plenty of the people have asked me before the session. Anybody want to jump in here? Or you just love hearing a Scottish accent, which I cannot blame you for. Okay, in that case, more... My mother, Leo Shalom. Yeah. had a, a broader Scottish accent than you do. Oh, I, I'm afraid my Scottish accent. My mother was really from the Gorbals. From the Gorbals. Uh, <laughs> I taught an elementary school in the Gorbals. Many a really? that, yes. That, that. I think there's a guy here who has his finger up. I think that's a way of attracting your attention. <laughs> I'm like, um, my name is Mendy Brookier. Um, I actually had a Scottish Kavrusa back in the day when I lived in Kyle under Rafi Berkowitz. 
Um, I'm actually Makarov today in, in Manhattan. I'm working for an organization called More Manhattan. I just wonder, Rest in, in, in your experience, for me, as somebody who is involved with, with people taking those first steps and really open, just opening the door, how, what is the key thing you want me to, to, to think about when I'm, when I'm, so to speak, being there, allowing them to take their first steps, going off there to Israel, perhaps? What you should be thinking about is what brought them to you. That's what you have to think about. It's clear philosophy plays almost no part in people becoming from. When, anyway, I've had fights with people about this, so I took a few steps back with with Noyak Shabodal Achaim David. I said, look, obviously it must be with girls. Afterwards, I found out it wasn't just it's with everybody. I once said that if if David Gottlieb had been Makara of the Boston Arab, I'd have had no choice but to have faith in philosophy. But it was the Boston Arab who was Makara of David Gottlieb. So I, I don't see where philosophy comes into this. You've just got to know what need you are fulfilling with these people. And that's part of empathy. That's the reward for empathy, is that they give this back to you. They're open with you. And once you find that, you have to try to accommodate them. They have, they have very simple needs. They may not express it that clearly, but if you allow them the room to do it, they will tell you exactly what it is they hope Yiddishkeit can provide for them. And we have to be involved from the perspective of the end user. There's nothing more painful than these families who host girls for Shabbos and have this regurgitated Torah. They think they remember from Yeshiva and they say it to them. They complete, it, that thing doesn't make sense. The girls come afterwards and they say, this is what he said, does it make sense? What am I supposed to say? Doesn't make sense. I say, no, you didn't understand it properly. The fact is, we are too into what we have to give. We have to say, what do they want? What do they need? And this is not so difficult to ascertain. Philosophy, you know, Rav Nachman of Bratzlow, over 200 years ago, he said that philosophy is a waste of time. There's only one country where philosophy is, is respected, that's France. And he learned it from the word sarfas, le tsareif, he said was the philosophical process. So he said, that's why when you, talk, you go to France, you see philosophers talking on the, on the television. When in America, who can name a philosopher in America? Nobody can. Nobody's interested in it. And yet we believe that because that's what we've been reading up on, that's what interests them. Find out what they need, and you'll see that's the key to their heart. And it's very simple stuff. It can be something as obvious as someone who listens to them, finally. Somebody's listening to them. That many of these people go, they go with sugar. They think they may be mad, because nobody seems to be interested in what they have to ask. You've got to make it clear to them that this is their opportunity to talk, and you will only say something when you believe it's absolutely required. Now, if you ask me, is it any different in any other area of human endeavor? Probably not. But you're a rabbi in Kirov, so I'm telling you. Thank you. No different with grandchildren. No, diff no different with children. That's what it has to be about. Offer them the opportunity because people don't feel that they have enough opportunity to voice themselves. Any other questions? I must tell you, I came to Kvach Hasidim. I was 19. My teacher of Ali Lapid was 89. When I used to speak to him, he used to be so wrapped up in what I was saying, it was unbelievable. He was sitting on the end of his chair, listening to somebody who's 70 years younger than him, and was probably asking him a question he's done hundreds of times before. And yet he was utterly wrapped up in listening. Good listeners are such successors in life because they're so rare. <laughs> That's all.
Well, we have to call the session to an end now. I'm extraordinarily grateful, as usual, for your <laughs> it's a pleasure. help. It really um, is a pleasure. Everybody else who's joined in, please spread the word of what Nir Talmud is trying to do to support the, the Valshuva community. Um, there, the sessions are every two weeks at the exact same Zoom address. Um, we're trying to build this up into a real support network for people who... Uh, As everything that Rabbi Rubenstein has done in his whole life, he's been able to put his finger on real needs, which is quite a rarity. And for the most part, people are selling what it is that suits them. He's been able to do that. And therefore, this is a remarkable in initiative. Anybody who wishes to ask me one-on-one -on -one any questions, my email is drefson at gmail.com. drefson at gmail.com. I can't promise you immediate answers. Because of, the, because of the coronavirus, there is a high call volume at the moment. As they say when you call anywhere, a high call volume. But it would be a pleasure for me to be of any help I can whatsoever. Thank you, Rabbi Rubenstein, for giving me this opportunity. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. See you soon.